children in a shell, in a glass ball, cut off from the world around them, barely able to communicate with other human beings, children afflicted with infantile autism, the invisible wall. Infantile autism, a rare and mystifying disorder of obscure etiology and uncertain prognosis. It is predominantly characterized by self-imposed isolation, disinterest in other persons, along with a compulsive interest in mechanical objects, insistence on the preservation of sameness, and highly characteristic language behavior. Jimmy is an autistic child, 11 years old, who has been institutionalized for the past five years. Periodically, he spends some time at home with his parents and younger brother, who is normal. His father is a specialist in nuclear power plants. Joseph is seven years old and is part of a lively, healthy family, which includes three brothers and three sisters. Both of his parents are college graduates. His father is a college professor. Leo is four years old and is an only child. He lives with his parents, both of whom hold doctorate degrees in chemistry and are employed as research chemists. Billy, at 10 years, is older than his brother and two sisters. He attended nursery school when he was four, but he is not now in school. His father is a college graduate and a self-employed businessman. Dr. Bernard Rimland, author of the book Infantile Autism, has developed a theory which attempts to account for the disorder. Dr. Rimland discusses his views with Dr. Paul Tusing, and Dr. Richard Sternloff of the Department of Psychiatry, Neurology, and Behavioral Sciences of the University of Oklahoma Medical Center. Infantile autism is a very uh, rare and a very severe behavior disorder of children. It was first identified by Dr. Leo Connor of Johns Hopkins in 1943. And since that time, uh, quite a number of these children have been seen uh, in various institutions uh, throughout the U.S. and also uh, throughout the world, uh, these children uh, look very normal to all intents and purposes. One sees a very attractive and very uh, normal, in fact, a, quite often an unusually attractive child. Uh, the child's behavior, however, uh, is in most cases unusual from the moment of birth. Uh, Dr. Connor described these children using the terms inborn disorder of affective contact. By inborn, of course, he meant that the child was brought into the world uh, having this uh, difficulty. Uh, and by affective content, uh, contact, he was referring to the fact that the children do not seem to relate to people in a very typical sort of a way. Uh, the children seem to be very distant and very inaccessible. Even uh, when the, the child is approached by the mother uh, in early infancy, when the mother wants to pick the child up, the child doesn't show the usual uh, anticipatory gestures that most children begin to show at about the fourth month. My mother came up to help me after, when I got home from the hospital, when I, the day I came home, Jimmy was five days old, and when she went to pick him up, you know how I like to cuddle little babies, he would stiffen. And we noticed this stiffening, whenever you try to pick him up, he never would seem to mold himself, so it was always kind of rigid-like child will sometimes appear to be so uh, inaccessible that sometimes the, the parents think the child is deaf. The parents describe the children as being in a shell or being in a glass ball. In fact, there was a book about an autistic child published in Sweden a few years ago that titled The Child in the Glass Ball. His behavior was very hard to manage, but I felt the reason I couldn't manage him was that I, I couldn't reach him. I would talk to him, and it, he would act as though he hadn't heard. And at one point, I 
suspected that he couldn't hear properly. Mm -hmm. But I gave him a very simple test. I had worked with testing children, uh, hearing of children before. I gave him a very simple test and knew he could hear. In fact, he could hear unusually well. So I, that uh, was settled. I knew he could hear. But um, it, to have him be out in the yard and to call him, he would never answer. Uh, I felt as though he were living all alone. In fact, sometimes I found, found myself, when I spoke to him, holding my hands on his face and saying, Joseph, look at me. I want to tell you something. Well, I think probably the basic thing that set him off from other children is, was the fact that he did not associate with children. He did not relate to people. He, uh, he related to objects more than he related to people. He didn't seem to want children, especially around. He, uh, very content when left alone, uh, would screech if a lot of people descended on him at once or if there was a crowd. He couldn't seem to take this. Well, when he was very, very, very withdrawn and nobody could get near him, he would spend practically all of his time drawing cars and trucks, nothing else. Daddy liked cars and trucks, and little Leo loved tiny things. Uh, and uh, Dad started buying him the matchbooks. Our nephews were visiting us, and they had some of these little cars and trucks. And Leo immediately grabbed them and started looking them all over. And that was at about 18 months to two years. He was drawing beautiful cars and trucks way before he ever walked. As soon as you tried to draw something else, he'd ignore you. Spinning his little ashtray, or anything that'll spin. Mm -hmm. Tops and himself, and, and uh, the other part of the time he spent up in his bed, rocking back and forth until the bed would just hop along the floor. This was the crib rocking stage. He would rock for hours on end during the night in his crib. Uh, he would get up uh, in the middle of the night and rock for an hour, an hour and a half on a rocking horse mm -hmm. that we had that we kept uh, in the living room. Uh, and it was, it was this kind of uh, continuous, incessant behavior uh, having to do with two or three different things like this that uh, uh, was very obvious. He's always done this with any object he's ever had from the time he was very small. I don't know why he does it. I've never been able to. I've studied this, but I just can't quite get what he does. But he'll take a book, and sometimes it's a rapid movement back and forth, and sometimes it's a larger movement, slower. But he, he likes books. Now, he'll go through books and look at pictures. He'll look at the picture, and then first thing you know, he starts turning the page. It's the same thing with objects, uh, toys, trucks, and cars, and, and uh, he'll do the same thing with them as he'll do with a book. Mm -hmm. It didn't, wasn't a, always a belt in the beginning. It was a piece of ribbon, a piece of rope, a uh, string from a Venetian blind, anything that would sort of dangle, and he would, you know, run around playing, and so he were, he talked to it. He doesn't play with toys. He doesn't read. Well, he just doesn't have any normal interest. And this is just an outlet of uh, probably a part of his dream world, I suppose. The, the child is not retarded in the usual sense. Now, there are a number of reasons for, for discriminating uh, autistic children from uh, run-of-the-mill retardates. One of these, of course, is the child looks so handsome and attractive. Also, their motor ability, their bodily grace and agility, and their finger dexterity sets them apart from the usual retarded child. Uh, he was very good with his fine motor movements. Uh, I, caught him, I caught him several times playing with brand new razor blades, uh, not making a nick on him any place. He could climb any place. He would put a chair on top of a, a stool, on top of a chair, with something on top of that until he reached the ceiling. He was always climbing, you know, he was perched on top of the refrigerator and always jumping from great heights. Mm -hmm. The children have always had plenty of paper to write on, but he chose to write on the walls. 
and he wrote, and no amount of scolding would help. Uh, only when I decided to truly spank him hard did he stop. We were the only house in the whole community that had his words on the ceiling. People are told about having handprints on the wall. I think I'm the only mother that had handprints and feet prints on ceilings. Frequently, the children turn out to have excellent memories because they can often reproduce musical uh, pieces that they have heard in with sometimes with perfect pitch and sometimes uh, with a remarkable fidelity of, uh, of tune and word, even at a very early age. If he hears a record, it, only once he can reproduce that with perfect musical pitch months and months later. He just seemed mesmerized by music. We put a record on and whatever activity he was in, where he would just stop and sit entirely until the music stopped. And when I would sing him songs at night, I would be leaning over him singing, he watched me, he, he would watch my face and my mouth with an uncanny, intent look, um, uncanny interest is what I mean for that age child. Um, it was, it was a, a, a really a very intent interest. I'd never seen a child look at something the way he would look at me, as though he were really studying my face. And sometimes when he began to sing, I, I said he didn't talk, but he'd sing. And he'd sing words. At 18 months, he could sing whole phrases of the Star Spangled Banner, which is more than some, some grown-ups can do. <laughs> Before he was four, he started reading. He insisted on knowing the alphabet. I, we, well, this is one of the first things you teach children when they seem to have a knack. Anyhow, I showed him the capital letters, which he did in no time. Within a week, he could write the entire alphabet. Then um, he began to scan the newspapers. And uh, on his own one day, he wrote the entire small alphabet. Then um, he began to pick out words. What is this? And what is this? I, I had showed him his name and all the names of the people in the family and a few basic words for identifying things around the house. And he began to go to the newspaper and say, what is this? And he was seen to be eager to learn. So I did sit down with him many times, and um, he began to read very simple things before he was four. Let's look at this newspaper. What does it say? And today, times the weather, windy. Windy and cool. But I do think that there's a great deal of similarity uh, in one sense between the child with infantile autism and the retarded child, and that is that the child with autism suffers from a very specific kind of a defect in his comprehension, in his cognitive ability. I regard autism as being, uh, to an extreme degree, the an inability to relate the to relate incoming sensation to the existing content of the child's mind to his existing memories he can memorize beautifully mm -hmm. but when you start to uh, ask him something or, or relating or whatnot he, he he can't do it i don't think he's being malicious or mean or doing it intentionally he just can't. He refuses to wor use the word I. He, re he can't seem to say yes. I don't know why. He'll say okay, mm -hmm. but not yes. It's just as if one part of his little brain is working and then the other, the part that <sighs> relates and builds upon experience and whatnot, just is not. The coordinating whatever it is in the brain just isn't working. He's just like, almost like a, a little robot or a computer. Things come in and, and come out exactly as they go in, word for word. The child with autism uh, pers uh, does, he senses stimulation, senses stimuli, whether they're sounds or visual stimuli, and is able to reproduce these stimuli with excellent fidelity. The physical qualities of the stimuli are, uh, are reproducible by the child. Uh, this is the phenomenon that Connor called uh, insistence on the preservation of sameness. The children have an extraordinary ability to perceive sameness in the environment. 
but they are incapable of understanding, uh, of dissecting the sensory input that they get, and in uh, thereby uh, assigning any sort of meaning to it. We noticed that he became very upset about things that seemed um, disorderly to him. For instance, he became very upset if we began to back up while in the car, if we stopped and suddenly backed up, or if going down a street we would turn around and retrace our steps. This would upset him very much. If a picture would be missing off the wall, it would, it would upset him. Recently, he still gets upset over things. Today, the sun is not shining, and he, was, he said in a very tense voice this morning, where is the sun? Or uh, in a book, a chapter heading, uh, a page where the chapter begins often doesn't have a number on it. I didn't know this either until he became very upset. Where is the 12? Page 12, where is the 12? It was missing. Or a page in a book that has a picture on it doesn't have a number on it. Did you know all these things? <laughs> I didn't know them until uh, Joseph began to point them out to me. These are things that made him very tense. He's been on uh, food kicks, like uh, he likes pancakes. Well, then, you know, he would, whenever you would ask him what would he like to have for breakfast, lunch, or supper, it would be pancakes. We went through a very long siege of hamburgers, and they had to be Carol's hamburgers. He could be not hungry, not hungry at all, and go out and pass Carol's and want to Carol's hamburger and eat it as though he were starving. On the other hand, in the summertime, uh, maybe we wouldn't have dinner, and for a treat we would go to a drive-in, you know, like a posh drive-in, <laughs> where they had, the hamburgers were 40 cents, which, you know, was kind of an expensive hamburger. And Billy could really be hungry, nothing from lunch, and he wouldn't touch that hamburger. When he goes outside, uh, it's, it's, it's the same every time. He goes out through the garage, and he'll go out and down the driveway a lot of times, and then run back and forth in front of the house. He's always liked to run past things and watch them as he goes by. And he'll run along the fence, uh, or just walk around. He seems to just be happy to walk around. One has to relate incoming stimulation to what one has previously remembered or previously experienced, and it is this ability that the children seem to lack. And so I do think then that, that autism is a very specific form of mental defect as distinguishable from the retarded child who ha whose entire profile of abilities is depressed. And I think that the defect is an inherited one. Uh, I think that the uh, children get from their parents a double dose of the, uh, of the mental uh, trait that characterizes the parents. Uh, the parents of these children tend to have an extreme ability to concentrate and uh, an extreme uh, uh, interest in uh, dealing with things that are rather uh, explicit and uh, careful sort of a way. Quite a number of the parents, for example, are physicists and mathematicians. And I think that what has happened uh, in these cases is the child has acquired the uh, parent's ability to concentrate. These parents have to be able to narrow their attention to a very small focus, just as one might have a searchlight beam that would narrow down to a very fine point and illuminate with great intensity a very small matter. Now, I think that what has happened with, in, in the case of children with autism is that they have inherited the ability to zero in on a very specific small subject matter, but they have not inherited the uh, ability to zero out, you might say, to broaden their span of attention. So consequently, they can memorize, uh, I, I might say they are forced to memorize, to deal only with a very specific thing right in front of them, rather than widening the context of what they perceive so they can understand it. Hey, Winnie the Pooh. Here is our friend Winnie the... He loves to eat especially at Rabbit's house. In fact, he is eating all of Rabbit's honey. He has eaten too much to get out of the door. Poor Pooh, half of him is stuck inside. 
Winnie the Pooh, says Rabbit, you are stuck in my... Oh, help, says Pooh. For here come Christopher Robin, Eeyore, and... And all of Rabbit's friends and... They tug and pull on Pooh's outside half and... Whee, says Pooh. I'm free. Hooray, they shout. Pooh's out. I think that, uh, like any other uh, genetic disorder, there's always an environmental factor uh, that, uh, that relates to the disorder, or usually an environmental factor. Uh, I don't know what it is in the case of autism. There's good reason to believe that the children, that the environmental factor in, in the case of children with autism is something like oxygen, uh, excess of oxygen in the, uh, in the uh, uh, atmosphere. For example, autism seems to occur somewhat more often in children who have been placed in medical oxygen in early life. Quite a few uh, books and articles are written as though it's, uh, it's an established fact that uh, the child's disorder was brought about by uh, psychological mistreatment or the way the child was treated psychologically by the parents. Uh, I think that uh, this is exceedingly unlikely for quite a large number of reasons. In my uh, book on autism, I tried to articulate as carefully as possible each of the arguments for psychological causation and each of the arguments for biological causation. And I came to the conclusion, and, uh, and I have no reason to, uh, at the present time, to depart from that conclusion, that it's extremely unlikely that the psychological environment, mother's treatment of the child, for example, has any particular bearing on the uh, genesis of the disorder. There are families uh, where you have an autistic child as maybe the sixth out of eight children, the other seven whom, of whom are perfectly normal. I know of a number of instances of, of uh, families with many children where the children are, are, are very, very normal. And even if the mother were somehow to treat this one child differently than she treated the others, which is really kind of an uh, unlikely thing, I think, one would have to imagine that the other siblings uh, had no contact with the child, the grandparents had no contact, the parents, the, the father. Uh, it just isn't a very tenable hypothesis. I think most parents who have been, uh, who had children diagnosed as autistic or schizophrenic or any of the severe behavioral disorders have very strong feelings about it. Because at every turn, uh, for some of the parents, at every turn they've been told that they caused the condition. Uh, they certainly have all been told this, but many of the parents I know have been told this every time they sought professional help. And yet they know that they have loved their children from the very beginning as much as the other children in the family. And that's the interesting thing. Almost all of them have other normal children. In fact, the sick child is usually the only one sick, not only in the immediate family, but in the extensive family, aunts and uncles and grandparents. So I do have strong feelings about it. I don't think it's true. <laughs> there must be another reason that these children behave this way. Joseph is in the middle of a large, articulate, um, normal, outgoing family. I know that I didn't treat him so badly that he is going to be maimed for the rest of his life. I just know this not, is not true. Uh, I think that the, uh, that what's going to very probably happen is that the, the wide range of things that we now group under the childhood psychoses uh, or uh, under childhood schizophrenia will be broken down into smaller segments. In the whole history of medicine, this has been the first step in the cure of anything is to uh, take a general concept like what was once called the fevers that were later broken into malaria and tuberculosis and this sort of thing, and to narrow er, and to uh, break it into smaller categories. Now, Connor has singled out infantile autism as one of these childhood psychoses. Uh, Heller's disease is another. And I think that we're going to have to break them down more finely into smaller subcategories. I, myself, am working on an objective di uh, diagnostic checklist approach to this problem. This checklist is capable of picking out cases of infantile autism, and we're doing factor analytic studies on this checklist now so as to section the whole area off into smaller, more manageable groups. Once these small groups are identified in 
and uh, children who cluster together in terms of their symptomatology are identified, then electroencephalographic and biochemical and chromosome and other work can be uh, pr can proceed uh, toward the goal of finding the drugs or the diets, uh, which will, in my opinion, be the ultimate answer to uh, the behavior disorders, to severe behavior disorders. Although the number of children afflicted with infantile autism is very small, investigators in many fields have begun to study this mysterious disorder. Research with these children is expected to cast new light on basic problems in genetics, brain function, human memory, and intelligence. Perhaps of even greater significance, scientists may, in time, gain needed insight into the bonds of interpersonal affection that underlie the development of the family and all of human society.